we are putting on a conference called Evolution Exposed. We pulled in experts on the subject of evolution for a total of 11 speakers and gave them just 15 minutes to give us their best. And on top of all that, a one hour Q&A panel session. You're going to love Evolution Exposed. Anyone can refute evolution. Due to the zoo, to me and you. Call that a fairy tale. Not allowed to ask questions. It made evolution look ridiculous. That was the foolishness of atheism. I yeah. knew I was going to get corrected. No, I wasn't even listening to your answer. Uh, fairy tale. <laughs> this guy might be coming for you. Welcome to Apologia, and another installment of Evolution Exposed, Exposed. Our claim-by-claim -claim investigation of the Creation All-Star Mega Seminar. If you'd like to catch the series from the beginning, tap on the playlist above my head. Today's video is brought to you by Sometimes Illness Wins, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. We just covered the first point of astrophysicist Dr. Jason Lyle's three-point science sermon. Science would do no good discovering patterns if there weren't any. And so these three principles, reliability of senses, rationality of the mind, regularity of, of nature, and I alliterated that for all the Baptists out there. So now let's hit point number two. What about the rationality of the mind? And how could we have an all-star response to rationality without calling in the man behind rationality rules? Our minds have the capacity to reason, to examine and evaluate truth claims using laws of logic to discern between truth and error. We can do that. So I don't want to jump ahead too far, but it seems that Jason is going to appeal to rationality, which is typically done by a subset of theists not to provide evidence of God's existence, but rather to discount naturalism or atheism. And that's atheism as defined as the belief that there are no gods, which is more commonly found in the philosophical literature. But we'll see if this is the route that Jason takes. He might not. Now, rationality is essential to science because we have to understand what our observations mean. We reason from our observations. Okay, so Jason is evidently using rationality in a colloquial sense, and he's not alone. A lot of people do this. He's using rationality as a synonym for reason. Given this, we can do the same, but it's worth noting that in philosophy and science, rationality tends to be used in a more technical sense. Namely, it's the quality of being based on or in accordance with reason or logic, and this doesn't necessarily mean having access to objective truth. So, an example that comes to mind relates to our ancestors that lived, say, 10,000 years ago. Our ancestors that lived 10,000 years ago would have been rationally justified in thinking that the Earth is flat, and if they had said that the Earth is a sphere, then because they didn't have the reason, evidence, etc. to demonstrate as much, they would have been irrationally holding a factual belief. Likewise, back in the time of Aquinas, it was rationally respected to believe in creationism, whereas today, let's say, not so much. This is why most PhD theists incorporate evolution into their worldview. Yes, it comes with a lot of baggage, specifically in relation to the problem of evil, but at least they're not denying what is just obviously the case at this point. However, to get back to the source, following Jason's lead, we're here use rationality as a synonym of reason, as long as you're happy with that as well, Paul. Well, when it comes to Jason Lyle, I'm rarely happy. But yes... Let's see where he goes. And so when Isaac Newton saw the apple fall from the tree, he didn't just say, oh, a falling apple. He reasoned from that and said, well, there must be a force between the earth and the apple. And that, for any, it, you know, he's able to figure out that that force is, is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the distance between them and so on and so forth. He was able to discover the law of gravity, which is a universal law that applies everywhere. He, he did that using his mind, not just his observations, but his mind applying uh, to the observations. Yes, and his mind also produced all his thoughts on alchemy. You turning that money into more money? Are you referring to alchemy? But setting this aside, there's quite a few things to unpack here. First, while it's true that Newton figured out that masses interact according to what we'd conventionally call a law, a law in science isn't, as Jason insinuates, a universal force or set of rules that apply everywhere. Scientific laws are simply statements, descriptions, that summarise observations, and since we haven't observed the entire universe, we can't confidently say that they apply everywhere, as Karl Popper, among others, have emphasised. Secondly, scientific laws don't explain why the phenomena <laughs> exists or what caused it. Now, Jason hasn't got to an explanation yet, I appreciate this, but we'll beat him to it. If we want an explanation for scientific laws, we're going to need a scientific theory. I've got a quote here from Peter Koppiner, who's an associate professor of biology and biomedical engineering. 
He says, laws are descriptions, often mathematical descriptions, of natural phenomena. For example, Newton's law of gravity or Mendel's law of independent assortment. These laws simply describe the observation, not how or why they work. And in Newton's case, we had to wait three centuries before Albert Einstein developed a theory that accounts for Newton's laws. Theists, however, and this includes Newton, tend to plug the gap in our knowledge with God, and once we figure out an actual explanation that's based on reason, logic, and evidence, theists simply migrate to the next gap in our knowledge, or, indeed, they reject the scientific explanation based on theological commitments, which is precisely what happens with creationists when it comes to evolution by natural selection. Now, rationality makes sense in the Christian worldview because human beings are made in the image of God. And to be rational is to think in a way that is consistent with God's character. God is ultimately rational. He's the source of rationality. And to be rational is to think, in, at least in a finite way, after God, to think the way he thinks. And it makes sense that we can do that because we're made in the image of God. And where do we learn that man is made in God's image? Well, that's in Genesis. That's a creationist principle. Our physical brain, along with our immaterial spirit, have been designed and created by God, and we have been given the capacity to think, to reason, as, as part of our image-bearing nature. Now we're getting into the thick of it, ain't we? So Jason claims that rationality, and by which he again more broadly means reason, can be accounted for by Christianity because we're made in the image of God. Now rationality makes sense in the Christian worldview because human beings are made in the image of God. And he claims that we know that we're created in the image of God because it says so in the Bible. And where do we learn that man is made in God's image? Well, that's in Genesis. The issue, of course, is that by referring to scripture to substantiate scripture, Jason is committing a logical fallacy. Namely, he's begging the question. He's starting with his conclusion. He has not in any way provided an explanation for why he can reason, but rather has simply insisted that reason presupposes God. In fact, he even claimed that God is the very source of rationality. God is ultimately rational. He's the source of rationality. And how does Jason know that God is the source of rationality? Well, get your jingle ready, Paul. For the Bible tells me so. Well, that's in Genesis. And how does he know that his reasoning, his inference from Genesis, is sound? Because reason presupposes God. He's the source of rationality. And like the wheels on the bus, we go round and round. And in terms of rationality, there's really not much else to say here. So unless you want to say something, Paul, I'm, uh, I'm happy to continue. Nope, you got this. But I'm standing by with jingles. When author Carrie Black faced the passing of her daughter, well-meaning people tried so hard to give her helpful books, but she just couldn't find anything available that was as good as it could be. So she partnered with Becky Bowles, a mental health clinician with a master's degree in social work, and wrote the book she wished someone had been able to give her. Grounded in secular, evidence-based best practices, Sometimes Illness Wins, A Guide to Understanding and Living with Grief, is a picture book for adults and children about navigating the loss of someone special without appeal to religions, superstitions, or platitudes. Written with a distraught brain in mind, this book is an entry-level distillation of information available about the grief process, what to expect, and what can help. One thing I love is that there are lots of blank spaces in this book. Everyone does grieving a little differently. This book is about the general process, but it's also about just you. If you or someone you love is going through grief, this is the perfect accompaniment to well wishes and a listening ear. Of course, we know that grief doesn't always give us advance warning. Your future self will thank you for having copies on hand when someone's life is hit with the unexpected worst case scenario, for not much more than the price of a grocery store sympathy card. Or you might go a step further and donate copies to your favorite teacher, therapist, counselor, or nonprofit. Whether you're going through grief now, or if you want to be prepared to console with more than shallow words, tap on the link in the description to order your copies today. But in the secular evolutionary worldview, your brain is just a non-designed accident of nature, just the result of mutations over billions of years that happen to convey some kind of survival value. Right, there's a few more things to be said already. First, notice that Jason equated secularism with evolution. But in the secular evolutionary worldview... Secularism is the separation of church and state, and it can be expanded to the seeking of removing or minimizing the role of religion in any public sphere. Whereas evolution is a biological fact, 
I'd personally suggest that Jason is conflating the two because doing so uh, sidesteps the issue of theistic evolution, which most academic theists adhere to. So Jason's conflation here is really quite, shall we say, problematic. Second, under evolution by natural selection, our brain is not just a non-designed accident of nature, as Jason claims. Your brain is just a non-designed accident of nature. There is, of course, an element of randomness in evolution, specifically the fact that when organisms reproduce, they don't do so perfectly, and thus there are random mutations. But as to whether or not these mutations will be passed on by the host depends, of course, on whether the host successfully reproduces. And this is where natural selection comes in. Mutations that are beneficial to the host increase the host's chances of survival, whereas mutations that are harmful to the host decrease the host's survivability. This is obviously not random. It's, in fact, extremely deterministic. If Jason wants to give an argument against naturalism, against evolution, or against any position, he has to, as a bare minimum, accurately represent the position. Why should it be able to reason? Think about that. How, how is an accident reason? You spill some milk on the floor and the milk starts to think, hey, here's the cure for cancer. No, it doesn't because it's milk. It doesn't think anything. It's just molecules doing what molecules do. Well, with Jason so obviously misrepresenting the view he's meant to be critiquing, we can simply move along. Now, in the secular view, your mind is just your brain and your brain's just chemistry. So not only is secularism separate from evolution, but it's also separate from materialism. Someone might, for instance, endorse secularism and evolution, but reject materialism. At this point, Jason's rant here is really quite a mess. Which cannot think, by the way. So the fact that we're conscious is something to, uh, that is perplexing to the secularist. Well, that depends on the other views that the secularist holds. If they're also convinced of evolution by natural selection, then consciousness isn't really all that surprising, as there's an obvious advantage to being conscious of one's environment. An organism that's consciously aware of its surroundings, that can predict phenomena... ...around them, has an advantage over organisms without such abilities. But rationality requires that we can consciously consider the various options and then freely choose the best. But in the secular view, our brains just chemical reactions and they have no choice at all. <laughs> oh man, this is really getting out of hand fast. Jason is now barking up the tree of libertarian free will, and he's suggesting heavily that reason presupposes it. But it doesn't. Reason doesn't necessitate that an agent make a non-deterministic choice. Reason is simply the capacity to consciously apply logic. Chemistry has no consciousness and cannot choose anything. You mix the vinegar and the baking soda, it will fizz. It has no choice about it. It doesn't say today, you know, I think I'll fizz today and tomorrow maybe not. No, it does what it must do under the laws of nature. But does vinegar and baking soda reproduce? Do they have babies that carry their genetic material? And does natural selection oversee that beneficial mutations accruing from the reproduction make it to the next generation, while detrimental mutations don't? No, <laughs> it doesn't. You'd think that Jason would know this by now, that he wouldn't use such obviously false analogies. So how could your mind possibly have the capacity to consider various options and choose the best if it's just chemistry. Now again, secularists might say, but, but I know that I can reason, my mind tells me that. Well, again, you're using your mind to evaluate your mind and that, that seems uh, viciously circular. But that's not the answer that people will give, right? They won't say that they know that they can reason because their mind tells them that they can reason. No, they reference external facts about the world to substantiate their view, just like Jason does. Now, yes, as any epistemologist will tell you, ultimately we all buy a few unjustified propositions. It's really frustrating, but that just is the way that it is. At least, that's how it seems to me, I should say. The difference, however, is that the secularist, as Jason would call a broad array of people, will more than likely ground their epistemology in propositions that are ontologically cheap, such as there being an external world, whereas Jason grounds his epistemology in something that is ontologically extremely expensive, namely an omnipotent, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, unembodied mind who endorses a book that's riddled with errors, contradictions, and atrocities. Or to swing at this from a different angle, if you don't mind, like presuppositionalists in general, Jason has recognised an epistemic grounding issue that affects us all. And if you're interested in this, I recommend starting with what's known as the Agrippian Trilemma. It will drive you nuts, and you're welcome. But rather than offering a solution, Jason has merely asserted that the very act of reason presupposes his conclusion. 
and he's then painted a picture of it being uniquely secularists that can't account for reason and rationality without making some assumptions. And by secularists, of course, he means people who, one, uphold secularism, two, are convinced of evolution, three, upholds materialism, and four, rejects libertarian free will. So I don't know about you, Paul, but it seems to me that Jason is really quite confused on a broad range of topics, and he's not actually offering anything substantive. He is, though, I have to admit, comfortably speaking very confidently about these issues. Which may sound ostentatious from a couple of uncredentialed cartoons on YouTube, but we put ourselves forth with humility, as mere enthusiasts whose word should be taken with skepticism, and as a jumping-off point for your own personal discovery. Jason points to his PhD in astrophysics as a broad license to declare discussion ended. Trust him. He's an authority, apparently on all things. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Most crucially, though, it's obvious that he started with his conclusion. This isn't philosophy and it isn't science, it's, it's faith. His own website declares this openly and plainly. The Bible is the ultimate authority in all matters including its own defense. It means that we recognize that there is no external standard superior to God's word, and we refuse to pretend that there is. If that doesn't make sense to you, don't worry. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Trust me, I'm a doctor. The secular says, but I can think, and my reasoning is often successful. And I would say, yes, that's because you're made in God's image, but it's not consistent with your professed worldview. Uh, at the risk of repetition, Jason has mischaracterized multiple independent views and has conflated them all into one that he calls secularism. He's pretty much just preaching to the choir here, because the only people that are going to take him seriously are those that don't actually adhere to these positions. It would be like Christians taking seriously an atheist who genuinely believes that they think that there's a man in the sky, and that they also buy Calvinism, and Molinism, and secularism, and evolution, and so on. Now, it's true that we Christians also believe in the rationality of the mind, but we have a good reason for it because God created our minds. Yeah, again, that's not a good reason for it though, is it? That's begging the question, that's starting with your conclusion. And it's, and it's true that we trust our minds before we read in the Bible that we can trust our minds, but we find that we're vindicated in our belief. Uh, we, we, we come to the conclusion that yes, we should be able to reason about things. Right, so Jason simply assumes that he can reason and only then finds a justification for his reason. But if he's going to just assume that he can reason, then so can we. Jason claims that he's vindicated in his trust of his reason by the Bible, but he offers no reason for this, no argument, no evidence. He just claims it. Whereas, and to take just one model, at least evolution by natural selection not only has abundant evidence in its favour, but it provides an explanation for why reasoning would be selected for. It's obviously advantageous to the host. And again, most Christians would say that God has used evolution for a purpose, and perhaps in part that purpose was to imbue in us a reasoning capacity. But the evolutionist, if he were consistent in his worldview, he should come to the conclusion that he cannot come to any conclusions. Because you see, there's no basis for rationality in his worldview. Well, the secularist could just say, like Jason, nope, reason is grounded in evolution, and then offer no evidence, no arguments, and no reasons. Or they can take one of many other paths. But, to be honest, due to Jason's gross misrepresentations and conflations, there's really not much to chew on here without taking the conversation far from his lair. So, I'm happy to wrap up if you are, Paul. Seems rational. But before I do so, thank you kindly, my fellow ape, for having me on. I really appreciate it. I love your work, I have for a very, very long time, and I deeply appreciate the time and attention you put into your projects. You are a beast, my dude. Back at you, Stephen. And if you're not already subscribed to Rationality Rules, I suggest you remedy that today. It's the only reasonable thing to do. Next time on Evolution Exposed Exposed, Jason is facing two strikes, but maybe he can finally score with out-of-context quotes from famous scientists. And I don't think he meant that in a Christian sense, he just meant that it's amazing. Amazing indeed. I'll see you over there. Later.